So it was the it was the gold and the money and listening to all those people talking about gold and we need governments to do less and all that. That's that's yeah. where the libertarian stuff came from. So we only in effect own half our labour. So it's a bit like the medieval serf who had to till his lord's land half the week. We have to give half what we earn to the state. With Malay in Argentina, there's a real chance to see libertarianism in action. If what happens with Malay works, then then other countries will go, well, Malay did it, we should do it, mm. and it will spread. There are various corporations that have adopted a Bitcoin standard. Bitcoin is, they account in Bitcoin, and they, uh, you know, MicroStrategy in, in the US, and El Salvador has is, 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 uh, uh, is made Bitcoin legal tender. So these are all movements towards a Bitcoin standard. Welcome to the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm Tom Clockerty. I'm the executive director here. And for the next 30 minutes-ish, I will be in conversation with Dominic Frisby. Uh, Dominic is a financial commentator, a comedian, and an author. His books include, you'll see why I invited him, Daylight Robbery, How Tax Shaped Our Past and Will Change Our Future, Bitcoin, The Future of Money, important to note the question mark at the end of that title, and Life After the State. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter, of course, uh, and he writes a popular substack, The Flying Frisbee. Um, Dominic. Hello. As I said, you're a financial commentator, you're a comedian, and you're also a popularizer of libertarian ideas. Most importantly. Most importantly. <laughs> Are these things more connected than they at first see? Well, there's the, the financial writing, the, I would say the comedy thing sort of happened by accident, right. and then the financial writing happened by accident after the comedy thing. Huh. And the libertarian thing happened as a result of the financial thing, if that makes sense. But the the I, I, when I was at um, uh, I, I went I, I went to drama school. Mm. But the reason I went to drama school is because I wanted to be a writer. And that sounds bizarre. But all the best writers started out as actors. Shakespeare, Dickens, they had all started out mm. as actors. So I had this idea that I should start out as an actor. But what I loved more than anything else when I was at drama school um, was rhyme, clever rhymes. And I would, I would, I loved Gilbert and Sullivan and Noel Coward and all this kind of thing. Mm. And while I was there, I wrote this comedy song called The Upper Class Rap. And uh, it, this was in the 90s and I was trying to get it released as a single. As do you mm. remember in the, in the 90s before you would have novelty singles that yep. came out as, at Christmas. And a friend of mine from university had become a music impresario and he managed a band called the Scissor Sisters. So I phoned him up and I said, look, I've got this comedy song. We should release it as a Christmas novelty single. And he said, go and do it in my brother's club. Mm. And his brother ran a comedy club. And I, I'd never heard of his brother, but his brother's quite infamous, a chap called Malcolm Hardy, who's a bit of a sort of legend uh, in, uh, in comedy. Among the many things he did, he stole Freddie Mercury's birthday cake <laughs> and sort of did all these weird pranks and things. But he had this club in Greenwich on a Sunday night. And in those days, if you did 10 minutes, an open spot, and it went well, they gave you a paid booking. And it was just utter mayhem in there. Everyone was getting booed off, things thrown at them. It was real kind of old school chaos, mm. chaotic comedy night. And my, I went on in a, a pinstripe suit and said, hello, good evening, I'm the rapper, and sort of did this uh, <laughs> thing. And it just went really well. And so they honored their promise and they gave me a paid, paid booking the following week. And so I literally was a comedian by accident, mm. but I was doing sort of funny songs. So that happened by accident. And, and, you know, I was being paid cash and I was making people laugh and, and, you know, it was just, it was fun. And they got me loads of bookings. It was, it was much easier in those days because there, there wasn't the same uh, number of people all wanting to be comedians and be famous. So that kind of happened by accident. I just found myself working as a comedian. And then in the noughties, my father had written this uh, musical that I, um, I just thought was wonderful. And we were trying to work out how to get it on in the West End. Mm -hmm. I'd seen it, it had been done in the provinces. And we figured we needed five million quid. We spoke to a producer and we needed five million quid to get this play on in the West End. And so I was thinking, well, how do, how do, we, how do we find five million quid? Um, and at the time I was just, the internet was just sort of starting out, sort of yeah. mid early noughties. And, and I, I started Googling, you know, investment and that kind of thing. And I found out about gold. 
and gold seemed to be the, the place to put your money in the noughties. And there were all these very intelligent people talking about gold. And so I thought, how do I talk to these people without having to give them any money to pay them for their time? And uh, so I started a podcast. And this was sort of before podcasting became a huge thing. But I very quickly learned that people will come on your podcast and talk, even if they're way, way higher up the sort of ladder than you, particularly if they've got a book they're trying to sell. <laughs> So I remember that my very first interview was with Jim Rogers, who was a famous commodities trader. Um, he was George Soros's partner when George Soros famously sold the pound um, in 1992. And he was the first guy I interviewed, you know, billionaire US investor. And um, so we, I started interviewing people on these podcasts, investing a little bit of money. And then one of the people I interviewed was this woman called Merrin Somerset Webb, who some of you may know. She was a journal at the FT and she was the editor of Money Week. And she said, oh, we need people like you to come write for us. And I was saying, well, I really don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> the, 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 the show was called Commodity Watch Radio. Mm. So I think she thought I was some kind of commodities expert because I'd interviewed Jim Rogers and the show was called Commodity Watch. And there was this big bull market in, in commodities at the time. So I just doing the usual comedian thing of just, take a gig when it's offered and figure out how yeah. to play the gig afterwards. And um, so I took the gig and what I learned was, this is where there's an interesting crossover, is when people talk about finance, in the world of finance, it almost, there's a sort of jargon that's peculiar to finance. And if you don't speak that jargon, it's quite alienating. And um, if you go one step up and you have Alan Greenspan, who was the, at the Federal Reserve Bank, he used to talk about purposeful obfuscation, where he would deliberately speak in riddles so that nobody could understand him, but sound like he was talking uh, really, you know, saying deep and meaningful stuff. You're just too stupid to understand what he's saying. But of course, he was deliberately doing it because he didn't want, he didn't know what he was doing a lot of the time. And he didn't want to say, I'm going to do this if it, it turned out he was going to have to do that. And you just find it all the time in, in, in finance, this sort of just obfuscatory language. But in comedy, you have to be clear. You have to be dead clear. Because if you're not clear, the joke, nobody laughs because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So the discipline of comedy forces clarity onto the... So, so, and I sort of took that, I have to be clear, into writing about finance. And also I was writing about gold, which was in a big bull market. Yeah. But because of that clarity, the, the column was very popular. And so it's, that's how it happened, really, all by accident. But there is a sort of crossover between the two. Yeah. And so you're, because uh, shows how well I've done my research, right? I was thinking this was going to be a story of you were a libertarian and then you got into finance and then you became a comedian later. Well, but it sounds like that got causation entirely the wrong way around. It happened exactly the other way around. Because yeah. then writing about gold... Because gold's a very political metal, it mm. used to be money for hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Uh, and, you know, people who like gold want sound money. And if, if a government's on a gold standard, they can only print as much money as they've got gold. So it forces discipline on mm. government, it, fiscal discipline, which are all things that, you know, libertarians, minarchists, those kind of people like, yeah. right wingers, IEA. And... I learned about gold and one thing I'd never understood was how it is that house prices can cost so much in London mm. when earnings are so much lower. And you, I learned about fractional reserve banking and fiat money and money printing and the effects of too much debt and the consequence to asset prices. And that's what turned me into a libertarian. So it was, the, it was the gold and the money and listening to all those people talking about gold and we need governments to do less and all that. That's, that's yeah. where the libertarian stuff came from. So looking back at my inbox, I think that I first became aware of you kind of around the time of the financial crisis. Um, I think we probably first met in 2011 when I invited you to a, a lunch at the Adam Smith Institute that was talking about the financial crisis. Um, don't expect you to remember this, by the way, so don't feel bad. But um, I, I'm kind of curious, looking back at the financial crisis, it was obviously a watershed moment. Um, you were obviously making some sort of investment calls of your own. Uh, but you were espousing a, a kind of a point of view about finance and economics, which was very radical, um, and maybe sort of rooted in Austrian economics, or that that came into it over time. Uh, and so I'm just curious to look back at the financial crisis. 
you know, what do you think you called right? Um, what maybe do you think you got wrong? And is there anything in sort of financial economics that has really surprised you about the years since the financial crisis? Well, the I'd like to say I saw the crisis coming. And uh, I suppose to it, I, I did to an extent because we had this idea and I'd written about it, about the global margin call mm. was the term we used, a global margin call. And that's kind of what happened. But when it actually happened, I remember I was having to write my weekly column for Money Week. You know, like everyone else, it was just happening so quickly. I was a rabbit in the headlights. Yeah. You know, same as that. I, mean, I was looking at the oil price and then the oil price collapsed. And I was thinking, why did that happen? I thought peak oil was a thing. And then, I mean, I understood what was going on. But, but what I am proud about what I got right was I was like, you have to own gold. Gold is sound money. The gold actually came down mm -hmm. with everything else. But it rebounded by much more, much more quickly than anything else. So owning gold was a good thing to own. So I, I would say I got that right. But, you know, I'd only been writing about markets for about two or three years at this point. I really was a rookie. And, you know, when markets are plummeting, even during COVID, you know, everyone was a genius after COVID because everything went up. But, but even during COVID, it was like, I remember when oil went to minus $30, 35, mm. minus 35. I was like, I have to buy oil. This is nuts. And there was a gang of traders from Essex who all managed to buy oil at minus 35 onto the very lay, and they probably never need to work again. But I was, I was like, oh, I'm too scared. Yeah. So it, 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 it affects everyone. But mm. yeah. I should probably do a disclaimer about financial advice before I ask this question. But sure. I mean, when people are getting into saving and investing, uh, is there anything you kind of tell them? What are the things they should think about? Well, in in um, my newsletter, the the main thing that anyone who's investing should never do, the number one rule is do not invest in anything to do with junior mining. That is the, <laughs> just, just do not go near. And, uh, and, and the second rule is anything to do with senior mining. Don't touch that either. Like, so... The, we have a thing in the newsletter called the Dolce Far Niente portfolio, mm. do, meaning do sweet nothing. And the idea of the portfolio is it's a portfolio that you can just leave and um, it's got, and you would sort of fiddle with it maybe two or three times a year. Right. And that, that sort of suits most of my readers. I, you know, some people who want to be investing in stocks every day of the week. Mm. And we have within that portfolio, we have... 10% for special situations and fun money. And, you know, you can invest in junior mining companies with that tiny portion. But in the portfolio, we have, I'm going to say this from memory, and we're going to get slightly wrong, but we have 15% in gold, physical gold, 5% in Bitcoin, 5% in uranium, uh, about 35% in equities generally, mm. with a bigger weighting to the US than anywhere else, uh, and quite a big, amount in oil gas and coal interesting uh and i think that's a pretty good you know a little bit allocation to japan and asia a little bit in europe but america's the most you know that's still for all its faults there was a wonderful line that i'm going to misquote but it's something like china's a prison uh europe's a museum and Japan is, I can't remember what Japan is. And, uh, <laughs> but, and that's why America's the best place. Right, you know? right. Yeah. Um, I would tell you you're, you're kind of an economic contrarian. A little do, bit, Do yeah. you think that that's helpful for investing? I think, like, there's so much sales patter mm. in investing that it, it, it does pay to be cynical about everything you hear. But at the same time, like... The people who make fortunes, mm. like I'm talking the big, big fortunes, like I think you need to concentrate your money in one thing to make a fortune. And that might just be like your profession. You know, you concentrate, you know, and it, effort is money in a funny kind mm. of way. So if you go, right, I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a lawyer and you invest all that time in doing that thing, that is concentration. So you kind of need to concentrate your money to make money. But once you've got money... You need to diversify to protect what you've got, if that makes sense. But when you're in a when you're in a bull market, you, sometimes you hear fund managers and they've invested in whatever it is, Nvidia or you know whatever the company is, 
and you hear them talking with this sort of passion yeah. about the company. And I think you really, in order to to get into a bull market early and run the whole thing, whether it's the commodities bull market of the noughties, China's growth, or the tech bull market, or Bitcoin, or whatever it is, you, you almost need to become an acolyte of that thing. You almost need to believe in it with a re with a almost religious fervor, because that keeps you in the market right to the top mm. and stops you selling too early. A cynic will sell too early. You know, you'll often hear bear, bear, bearish arguments are very persuasive, but bulls make more money than bears. Mm. But then the problem with that is if you're religiously fervent about a market that's plummeting, then you get in trouble. So I mean, you, way, you yeah. hear like Bitcoin, for example, which has been the most amazing money making opportunity of the last 10 years or whatever. You know, you hear Bitcoin is talking. It is, it is a religion. It is a cult. But that's what keeps them long. Yeah. It's a good so, way to make a lot of money, probably also a good way to lose a lot of money. Absolutely. So let's move on to your libertarianism more broadly. Um, and I'm going to read a quote from your 2019 book, Daylight Robbery, on about tax. So you said, this, I think this is towards the end of the book, just as religious doctrines provided the guiding narrative for many centuries, to be followed by the varieties of secular socialist and social democratic thinking that dominated the last century. So libertarianism is one ideology that will dominate the next. I mean, a lot's changed since 2019, but do you stand by that statement? I, to be honest, I don't even remember saying it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was thinking about that the other day, and I'll give you, I'll give you, um, I think yes is yeah. the answer. Um, like, it is the dominant ideology of the internet, mm. for sure. And I'll give you a really telling example. About a month or maybe six weeks ago, Javier Millet, the new Argentinian president, went to Davos to give a speech at Davos. And Javier Millet is a showman. He, he's an ex-TV presenter. He's a real flamboyant showman. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of that. And, but if you actually watch his speech, it was really quite boring. Mm. He didn't do all the showy stuff. He literally just read a speech and he didn't even look up from his speech. He just read it like that. But he kind of really put the boot into not even just socialism, but social democracy and the whole mm. kind of technocratic WEF Western European model. He really put the boot in. And that speech had, I think, something like 50 million views. I mean, it just went totally viral on the internet. But on that day, I happened to be looking at the WEF website, as one does, and I saw that his speech had had 5 million views. And the next most watched speech that day was Macron, Emmanuel Macron, 20,000 views. Mm. Now, Macron's, you know, technocratic ideology dominates Western European politics at the moment. That's how everything runs and the state's going to do this and the state's going to do that. But the but clearly Millet is espousing the doctrines that people believe in. Mm. Now, we're in a, a, a big test at the moment because, you know, the, the great thing about being a libertarian is you can sit on the side and go, the government will make a mess of it. Free market would do it all much, much better. And you can hold court and you'll always be right because it's never going to happen in the real world. Do you know what? We're never going to see it. It's never going to be given a chance because... We're working just, on it. The, I know you yeah. are. <laughs> I know that's a really negative thing to say, but the blob just... You know, we had a little glimmer with, with Liz and, you know, we did a little glimmer in that budget. I was like, oh, oh, glory. But she only shaved, you know, three or four percent off whatever it was. And then the blob just took her out. Mm. I mean, there may be other interpretations of that, and we can talk about it if you want. But with Millet in Argentina, there's a real chance to see, you know, I know the purists, he's not going to be, he's never going to satisfy the purists, but he, we have to take it as a win. There's a real chance to see libertarianism in action. And if it works, like governments are full of people who don't like taking risks. Mm. You know, whether it's career risk or any kind of risk. You saw it with COVID. Just what happened with COVID is every government just copied what the next country up the road did. And it was just a, the lowest, what is the lowest risk thing to do? Just copy, well, they did it in France, we'll do that. And But if, if what happens with Malay works, 
then then other countries will go, well, Malay did it, we should do it. Mm. And it will spread. So I really pray to the Lord that that what he does works. Yeah. And he yeah. doesn't get undermined by his own, the Argentinian blob. I mean, it slightly pains me to say, I don't really think Liz Truss was taken out by the blob, but we don't need to dwell on that okay. one for now. Well, um, so I think one of the big themes of that book, Daylight Robbery, and you, you sort of reference it saying that libertarianism is, is the ideology of the internet. Um, but that is that technological advancement is going to be a real game changer um, from the, the libertarian perspective. Um, and things like being a digital nomad and cryptocurrency and the Internet of Things were basically going to make funding a big state way more difficult. Um, can you sort of tell us more about that, that theory that you have? Well, yeah, I can. By the way, I don't know the full details of this story, but I, I'm just following it sort of from the outside, but I see that Elon Musk has fallen out with the Brazilian government over something. I'm not quite sure what he's fallen out with them about. And But he, I noticed he's, he's just turned around and said, well, I'm going to provide Starlink for free to Brazilian schools. Mm. And because Elon Musk is providing Starlink, Starlink from satellites from space, there's probably not a lot the Brazilian government can do unless they decide to take out Elon Musk's satellites, which I don't, I don't even know if they have the capacity to do that. I don't know. Mm. But it gives you an example of, right in front of us, a very current example of how tech can bypass governments. Yeah. And yes, you can censor the internet, but it's sort of happened. It's sort of, so that's, a, that's an ongoing process. Mm. And, and a, but then a lot of the big tech companies have obviously got involved in quite heavy censorship in order to appease government. So it's a that's it, it's it's a bit more muddy than that. But the the general idea of the digital nomad argument is that the the freelance workforce is like. Let me backpedal a bit. The 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 Western nation state something like 50% of government revenue around the world derives from income tax in the developed world. And income tax was a, is a brilliant tax from the point of view of the governor because it's a really easy tax to collect because the companies have to collect the tax on your behalf. So you, you penalise the companies if they don't do it properly, so the company becomes your tax collector. Mm. And it's built around a, an economic model where people are based in one place and goods and services are coming in and out of the country and people are going to work in the same place every day. Now, so it's built around the physical world and the physical economy. In fact, the whole nation state is derived around the physical economy. And now we've got this sort of borderless medium that is the internet. I know it's not quite borderless, but we have got the borderless medium. We've got borderless money as well in the form of Bitcoin and currencies. Mm. The state doesn't have control over that in the same way that it does over the physical economy. And so you find that, you know, so you see corporations, for example, you know, Starbucks will have their shop here, but the IP is in Holland and there's, and the, uh, the, the something else is somewhere else. And they put their, their different profits in different places. And so pay way less tax than they would if they were only based in this one country. And that same possibility is opening up for individual workers. And so you're seeing fewer and fewer people work in full-time employment and more and more people work as freelancers. That is a growing trend. I think that the freelancers, and it's been proven time and time and again that a freelancer doing the same job as someone in full-time employment will pay less tax. Mm. Not necessarily because he's avoiding tax, but because taxes are harder to collect after the event than they are to deduct at source. And so there's more scope for error. He can find more things to write off. Sometimes he won't file the return properly. There's all sorts of reasons why. Mm. But the, end, the net result is that he pays less tax. So you, what you've seen recently is this clamping down on limited companies and freelancers and all that. You've, there's, a, there's a clamping down going on because governments have realized. But within the sector, that, so the, but, but more and more people are leaving. And COVID accelerated this more. There was loads of people were moonlighting during COVID and doing several jobs at once. But more and more people are becoming freelancers. And then within that freelancer, more and more people are going, well, hang on a minute. I can do this job. I can be a graphic designer or a web designer or my son is working for a company recruitment. 
and he but it's basically his whole day is spent looking for people on LinkedIn yeah. and he could earn a London salary but have you know Thai expenses you know and and so more and more people are going well I can still do the same job but I'll just go and live somewhere cheaper and you know the housing market is driving more and more young people away for obvious reasons because nobody can afford a house and taxes as well and so people and, and the digital nomad is the world's fastest growing workforce. And it's not just a Western European thing. It's, um, you know, the guy, the, the, the Uber driver who's come here from wherever it is, Eritrea or wherever he's come from, is a form of digital nomad in a funny kind of way. Mm. And, you know, so it's not just Europeans and Americans. It's, it's, it's Asians, Africans. You know, the world is on the move. We're in a global migration of historic proportions. And when people aren't fixed in one country, it's not always clear who they should pay tax to. So even if they want to pay tax, they're not quite sure who. And so you'll, what eventually we'll, you'll see, maybe over the next 20 years, a trend is that the revenues from income tax will come down a little bit. And that is the government's key source of revenue. And you'll see this growing workforce of kind of nomadic people who aren't necessarily from one any particular country the prime minister's wife mm. you know is a non-dom so or maybe not was. anymore was yeah. but you you got my point and this will erode revenue to the government at just a time when it's spending more money than ever before mm. and so this deficit one day these deficits they don't seem to matter at the moment but one day they will matter yeah and then when they do matter it'll look really obvious <laughs> so I want to ask you about cryptocurrencies. Sure. You've obviously written a lot about crypto. It sounds like you're still bullish about it. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I've had, I've had phases of being really interested in crypto. One very depressing episode where I sat and worked out when crypto, when Bitcoin hit $20,000, I thought, how much money would I have if I'd bought £100 the first time I wrote about this thing? Never, never made those kind of calculations, I can tell you. Um, but like, have the, obviously, the shine has come off crypto a little bit, or it seems that way um, in the last few years. Um, a lot of the scandals, a lot of the kind of government interventions and regulations of the market. Um, like, is this an example of um, a good idea that's been kind of messed up? Uh, is it an idea of people that are kind of losing interest, losing faith in it too quickly? Um, does it still have major applications for the future? It, it, it's one of those things. It seemed like the future a few years ago. I feel like everyone's turned off it now but you're still bullish. Well, I don't accept that the shine has come off it because, mm. you know, I'll look at my phone and I'll see that the Bitcoin is $71,000 a coin and I think the all-time high is 72 or 73. Mm. So it's... it's. I like, bet I'll do my calculation yeah, again. Yeah, it's a couple of percent <laughs> off, off all-time highs and um, we've got this halvening event coming up and um, so uh, it's a huge, huge growth area and mm. there are all sorts of applications beyond an alternative, you know, non-government system of money. There are about a million different applications. And for cross-border transactions, it is the best, it, particularly whether it's micro track, you know, a, a guy sent a billion, $1.3 billion last week in crypto, and it cost, the transaction cost him $2 to send $1.3 billion. Mm. And, and similarly, I can send the, the equivalent of, one twenty fifth of one cent. Yeah. Okay. So at the tiniest micro payment, I can send that to you know Johnny Mc Mc McFace in wherever he is in Asia or Africa or anywhere. And and you know the internet is a borderless medium and it's a borderless mm. system of money for this borderless medium. Uh, it's uh, it, it's 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 growth. Its potential even from these high levels is so extraordinary. For me, I would just say. Just ha own a tiny bit. The, mm. the risk is not owning it. Fair enough. Um, so tax is in the title. You wrote a book about tax. Tax has been sort of my main policy area for a while. So I've got to ask you at least one question about it. And sorry to the rest of the audience. Um, but you talk about, in, in Daylight Robbery, about your utopian tax system. Um, can you fill us in briefly on that? And, you know, have you given much thought to how you get from A to B? Or is that, is that our job? Well, that's that. I, I, it's your, that's your job. The, 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 the nation state as we know it, you know, the, the Western European nation states are actually a relatively new 
we you know we think of Italy and Germany and France or wherever, but you know Italy was only unified in what eight, 1861, mm. but really it was only the unification only was complete by the time of Mussolini. Germany is a relatively new country, um, and the nation state, the borders of the nation state, are defined by the tax systems. Now, if my theory of you know governments which are essentially bankrupt because they're you know they're spending way more than they take in, mm. if that process continues then you may see borders, as we know them, disappear. Because, it's, it's, as I say, it's a relatively new thing. It's only a couple of hundred years old. Um, and, but the, one of the central arguments of daylight robbery is that tax is, is not just the defining feature of our age. It, is, it defines all of history. And you can, you, you know, people, this idea of a sense of duty to the greater collective, it will have existed in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization. There has never been a civilization without taxation of some kind. Mm. It's inevitable. There have been examples of voluntary taxes, ancient Greece, but it is still nevertheless taxation. Um, and so you will always have taxes, but there's, and taxes are kind of like a measure of freedom in a funny kind of way. And, you know, Maggie used to say you can't have economic, you can't have freedom without economic freedom. And at the moment in the West, roughly 50 percent of everything we ever earn is taken from us in taxes. So we only, in effect, own half our labor. So it's a bit like the medieval serf who had to till his Lord's land half the week. We have to give half what we earn to the state. Obviously, life is a lot better for us than it is for the medieval serf. But you look at societies in the past and the most innovative and the most brilliant societies have always been low tax places mm -hmm. where taxes have been 10, 15, 20 percent of GDP rather than 40 percent. And, you know, we're what are we now? 42, something like that. Well, tax is probably like high 30s at the moment. Then. But OK, yeah. but then by the time you factor in 10 percent lost currency depreciation to inflation, sure, we're yeah. close to 50. Yeah. So anyway, and debt is a form of debt is just a tax on the future. Mm. And, and obviously inflation is taxation without legislation. And, but you can look at history, and once you start looking at history through this prism of taxation, you can, you can go, there has never been, it, like, taxation, you could shout any, like, any war in history was funded by some kind of tax, either before or after the event. Every conquest was about taking control of the tax base. You, you plunder and then you tax. The land, the labour, the produce, the profit. Every revolution was uh, a, a rising up against some kind of injustice perpetrated by the tax system, some kind of economic injustice. And you th even think like the birth of Christ, well, Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem to pay taxes. You know, Islam, why would it, Islam grow so incredibly fast in the seventh century? Well, everywhere they conquered, they said, convert to Islam and you'll pay lower taxes. And everyone's like, oh, I'll convert <laughs> to Islam. It was like, it was a brilliant model. And, um, and, and, um, uh, Laffer got all his ideas um, about the Laffer curve. You know, he says, he willingly says he took them from the Islamic philosophers huh. who were big low tax guys. Uh, early Islam and, and early Islam was a, you know, it was a brilliant, the, the contribution of early Islam to society, mathematics and various other things and trade and so on was brilliant. Um, so, yeah, so tax has defined history. The first men on the moon were if we actually did tread on the moon. Uh, <laughs> That's one of your songs, isn't it? Yeah, I have to do that one. And, uh, but yeah, that, I mean, that was a, you know, so it's, it's just, if you look deep enough, there's a tax story behind everything. And even natural disasters, they're like the one sort of area of history where there isn't a tax event, but there's always a tax event or a tax factor in the, in the after effects of the, the natural disaster. So for example, the Black Death kind of changed, was the, beginning of the end of feudalism and it changed the st tax structure or you know the, the great fire of london london was rebuilt with a coal tax you know it's it's the tsunami you know the the is indonesian tsunami all the reparations for that came from taxes and so on so it's just everywhere once you start looking and you know tax is sort of taught as a subset of economics but i just think it's a it's a should be a subject in itself first and foremost yeah I, I quite agree with you thank you for that let's, let's make the obvious leap from tax to comedy <laughs> easy segue um i mean elon musk you mentioned him already recently shared your song we're all far right now uh, and I, I checked before we came down you're not far off 50 million views I know. on that retweet yourself now almost as many as javier millet right <laughs> the, the two great libertarian yeah. hopes yeah um <laughs> 
does this feel like a real moment in the sun? Were we lucky to book you for this before your rates skyrocket? Well, um, what's going to happen? As soon as I can put the IEA into distant history, the better. And no, I, I <laughs> yeah, a lot of people say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, it, like, it was bizarre. I put the video up on Facebook on the same day that I put uh, it up on Twitter. And Elon Musk obviously retweeted it. Mm. And it got, had 50 million views on Twitter. And at the same time, it had 77 on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. And, and there was a real, like, you, you hear about dopamine rushes you get, mm. you know, I, I mean, I had the mother, I was, for hours, I just couldn't stop reading comments and I, it was a real, you know, dopamine addiction. And um, me, my girlfriend was going to me, you need to be in touch with the agents in America and you need to do this and you need to be speaking to Hollywood and contact all this. And I mean, that, that it's, the excitement's died down a bit, but he does follow me now. Yeah. So maybe I'm like scared to put anything on Twitter in case he unfollows me, but <laughs> the... <laughs> But I, I mean, I really hope it, um, you, you know, I, I really care about the financial stuff and the books mm -hmm. and everything, but my first love is comic songs. And if, if, if I could, you know, I do my little tour and I get lots of people into the shows and we did one on, Sat on Saturday night in Bath and I went to load my stuff up into the car and people were clapping me in the street. It was, it was really good. And, and, you know, people really seemed to like them, but if I could take them to a, you know, bring laughter and to a bigger audience, then I, yeah. I would love to be able to do that. Yeah. And w when you're doing your comedy, are the audiences mostly sort of politically aligned? Do they do they think you're doing a political set? Or do, I mean, have you got crossover appeal? You're appealing to people who um, maybe they're not political. They just think you're, you're generally funny. Well, there's 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 three types of audience. Mm. There's uh, and there's three types of gig, and there's the there's the gig when they've come to see you. Right. So they know who you are. There's the gig when they've come to see comedy. So you're just on a comedy bill in a comedy club. Mm. And then there's the gig where they've come to see neither you nor comedy, <laughs> which is, a, you know, like you might be doing a, a, an act at an award ceremony or something like right. that. And the, the, the gigs where they've come to see neither you nor comedy are the, the hardest. Mm. And from which, you know, you need your bulletproof vest and 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 nerves of steel and all the rest of it because people are not interested. Yeah. And then if you if I was just doing a regular comedy club, like if I was emceeing, you know, up the creek or 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 the Banana Club or downstairs at the uh, King's Head, I wouldn't do my heavy duty libertarian stuff. Right. I would I would do more popular accessible songs. I wouldn't go heavy. But when people have come to see me, it's what they want. Yeah. So they get the heavy, they, yeah, get, they the get hardcore it. stuff. I mean, why do you think comedy, or at least this seems to me, is so dominated by the left? If you turn on TV and watch the stand-up that makes it onto the BBC or wherever, I mean, a lot of it seems to just be comedians sneering at conservatives. And that would maybe make sense if that was transgressive in some way or really radical and out there. But it's not. They're just sort of spouting the common wisdom of the age. It doesn't seem funny to me, but like, why is comedy in the state that it's in? If that is a fair representation, well, I would. I think live comedy is in, in pretty rude health. Yeah, okay. it's a, it's it's you know, there's left wing clubs and right wing clubs, and a lot of people are going to comedy, and maybe I mean, it, there's a sort of it's it's a, the 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 existence of a comedian is actually quite a libertarian existence because everyone's out for themselves, but you know, in order, you know, I want as many people to love me as possible but in order for m as many people to love me as possible i have to make as many people as possible laugh yeah so you know it's a kind of two-way thing and you're, you're your own little business you've got to go out and get the work and you know there's no it's the one art form that survives on its own merit doesn't need subsidy or anything like that at the grassroots level mm -hmm. and you know you're, you're your own little thatcherite small business when you're a comedian um but so there's a contradiction between the fact that you are your little thatcherite small business but at the same time you're doing that to the tories yeah. it's a sort of inherent contradiction there but i think when you get into tv comedy it's just the cultural establishment particularly the bbc is so totally owned by that sort of left of center social democrat remain voting you know that kind of worldview mm. it's just dominated by that and so to book people who don't have that worldview it's just there's just so much career risk involved to the commissioner who would do that 
And most aren't prepared to do that because they don't want to give that wrong view a platform anyway. But I mean, I, for example, I know that the Radio 4 audience would love my song. Maybe not the hardcore political ones, but the more sort of mm. mainstream. I just know they'd adore it because they're good songs and they're funny and they're clever and they're witty and blah, blah, blah. But no Radio 4 commission will ever give me a gig because they're like, oh, you, you're the guy who did the song about Brexit. No, you know, never mind the fact that more than half the country voted for it. So, so it's, it's a, yeah, so that's a big problem that comedy has. The cultural mm. establishment is, has that, is just completely dominated by that left to centre worldview. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not gonna... you, well, I was just going to say one more thing. Yeah. Just sorry, just suddenly remembered. I remember before this, before like I don't know when the culture wars started, but let's just say they started in 2016 on the 23rd of June. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, but before then, it's still like you would find left wing comedians were really vocal about their politics, mm. and it was fine to be a Marxist or a whatever, and guys who were like into small government and all that kind of thing. They just kept the politics themselves and they would do word play acts or they would just do character acts or whatever. Mm. They just would leave their politics at the door. And for some reason, it's always been acceptable to be really vocal about left-wing stuff. You know, George Bush is an idiot, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, that was, we had eight years of that. Yeah. And he clearly... I mean, you, 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 I don't believe you can be the president of the United States and be an idiot, but we had eight years of listening to why George Bush is an idiot and have all sorts of things he never said ascribed to him. And, you know, so it was, it's been going on for a long time. So it's been fine to be left wing, but right wing is it's never been acceptable. I don't know why. Yeah. So I can't pretend to know all of your songs. I had a little rustle through the, the most recent ones recently. Um, I particularly like the one called Hate Speech oh, yeah. and where the woman has the uh, the mental explosion at the end and the kind of the, the cowboy country character you play in that. That one's quite fun. Going back a bit, Debt Bomb, State of the Union address set to Tom Jones' Sex Bomb. Very funny. But which is your favourite of your songs? Is that one that you're really proud of and that everyone should go away and watch or listen to? Funnily enough, the, one, the songs I like the most are not necessarily the most popular. Mm. But... I love Gammon and Proud. <laughs> I just really like that song. And uh, like I was listening to loads of French 60s folk singers, chansons, yeah. you know, um, at the time. And it's musically, it's got the most chord changes in it. It's the most, the boldest. So I love that one. And um, I like Mary Gary. It always goes down well, Mary Gary. Oh, bollocks, I'm proud of, you know. So I'm, yeah, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what my favourite is, but... Uh, maybe I want to be in the Illuminati. I think that's pretty good. Oh, okay. That's good one. Okay. So I was I was hesitant about this, but I wanted to ask you about the I Want to Marry Gary oh, yeah. song, right? Um, because I'm sure people have told you, you know, that's transphobic. It's certainly a very politically incorrect song. But when I listen to it, it actually seems to be making like a more classical liberal point that's kind of live and let live. Who the heck cares? Is that right, or is there something else behind that song? I wouldn't. I I just think like that song came around because uh, um, I remember exactly the moment where it, where it came. So uh, I was lying in bed with my girlfriend one morning, and we hadn't been together that long, and I was very much in love. And I and I said, I literally turned to her, I said, "I've fallen so in love with this girl, her name," and then I just went, "Is Gary." Because it just, it was just funny. And so I just said it as a joke. And then I'm sure it went down really well. Well, actually not. But, <laughs> but and it, it was like, and then, you know, I'm going to marry Gary was the obvious next line. And so the, the song just kind of, it really did write itself. It does happen sometimes. 17 million F offs wrote itself. Um, we're all far right now wrote itself. They just, sometimes they just write themselves. And like, when we made the video of that, we got Leo Curse who's six foot seven uh, to play Gary because it was just funny having a six foot seven uh, Matt, obviously. And we got, we made him up really badly. So he just didn't look remotely feminine only because the more obviously like a bloke he looked, the more ridiculous my uh, unrequited, uh, my total dedicated love for him looked. It was, it was, that was all it was. It's just to make it look more ridiculous. But the, a couple of one of the other guys who was in the video and the guy who directed the video 
they were, you know, they're both left to centre guys, mm. but, you know, we're all comics and we're all mates and we made stuff together. They're both left to centre guys. They would not put their name on it. And they actually begged, after making the video and when we had it, they then begged me not to put it up. Really? Because they, I'll make you loads of free videos. I'll do anything. Please don't put it up. But I said no. <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I think I was right to. And now he, he messages me, go, oh, I'm so proud of that video. It's so good. I'm like, why didn't you put your name on it then? But yeah. anyway... I think that leads nicely into my final question yeah. here, which is, can libertarians win in the culture war? Or does it just end badly for us either way? Um, well, I don't think the culture war ever ends. Mm. I think libertarians and statists and whatever have been having this same argument, dance, push and fro throughout all of history. You know, there were probably Romans. We, you know, I don't know, the Institutos Economicos Aferos in ancient Rome were probably sat there having the same conversation. But the, the, I, I don't, I, you know, you have little victories and you have little losses. But I think the argument, how much, what is the right amount of government is an argument that never ends. Very good. But we're right and so we will win. Yeah, th thanks for bringing that on to a nice note for the end there. Um, so thank you, Tom. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, so first hand up, Hunter, in the second row. Thanks, I think maybe there's a microphone coming. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Hey, Dominic. Hey, Hunter. Hi. Um, what happens to money, tax, and culture under a Labour government? Well, the I've got a funny feeling that the Labour government might not be that bad. Because hmm. what happened to the Tories is they were so petrified of the Guardian and the BBC and the left-wing media that they spent almost all their energies of the last, whatever, however long they've been in power, since 2010, 2011, whatever it is, trying to keep, trying to appease that world view. Hmm. And... Uh, and obviously to the total detriment of themselves and their voters and their supporters and everything else. But they're effectively a social democrat party. And, and that, that was trying to keep the, the noisy right-hand side, the Jacob Rees-Mogg's of this world, you know, <laughs> isn't he funny, shut up. And, uh, and it wouldn't surprise me to see this, the same thing happen with Labour, that they're desperately trying to keep the Owen Joneses and the Corbyns and just, just go away and leave us alone. And, and it wouldn't surprise me to see them pander to the right-wing media and end up being exactly the same as the Tories. And I just think, and, and I heard this argument, and there is some truth to it, that Rishi uh, is a sort of placeholder for Keir. And uh, I, 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 I mean, it, it'll get a bit worse, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's the end of civilization. And I think the blob will keep us on the sort of the social democrat technocratic path and i actually i often wonder how much change is actually possible in the uk with our systems as they are mm. very interesting uh another question yep uh felix it could also be awful <laughs> and there, there is that possibility hedge your bets yeah here <laughs> yeah. uh hello uh, you mentioned that you uh, when you started off, you were interested in how house prices in London could be so high, given uh, specifically in relation to incomes. Did did you ever figure that out? What was the what's the what's the big deal? Yeah, the 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 reason for high house prices. There are so in one of my talks, I have a list of different items: uh, a house, a sa the average salary. Uh, a pint of milk, a, a car, a full Cortina, a, a dozen eggs, those kind of things. And I have them on the wall and I show the price in 1971 and I show the price now. And house prices have gone up since 1971 70 times. The average house has gone up 70 times. The average salary has only gone up 20 times. So house prices have gone up by three and a half times as, mu as, mu as much as salary. Then you look at the average like a Ford Cortina, if you compared a Ford Cortina in 1970 to, you know, whatever it is now, Ford Mondeo or whatever it is now, that car would be about 40 times more expensive. 
But a pint of milk would be, I think it's, I'm trying to remember, maybe five or ten times more expensive. And a, a phone call has actually got cheaper. You know, in, in 1971, I think a phone call was like 10p for a local call. Do you remember? And he had three minutes and the thing went pit, pit, pit. And that was actually about 1980. But anyway, and whereas now you can make a phone call to anywhere in the world, video call, and as long as they got internet access, is free. And what you have with salaries and pints of milk, uh, for the most part, you pay those, you pay a salary mostly out of cash flow. You don't borrow money to pay salaries unless it's a business starting out. For the most part, salaries are paid out of cash flow. And eggs and milk and washing machines and things like that, we buy with cash. Whereas houses, we buy with debt. And the, it's debt coming into the market. If you introduce debt into a market, then you enable prices to go much, much higher because effectively you're introducing more money into that market. Money is debt, as I'm sure you know. And by issuing debt, we're creating money. And then if things get too inflationary, the Bank of England has a remit to put up rates and uh, put a cap on inflation. But the Bank of England, in its measures of inflation, doesn't include house prices. And it does include everyday items that we buy with cash and also just things that are um, prone to the uh, deflationary forces of improved productivity so that, that we get better at making them so their price comes down. Whereas, so you're in, you, so things, markets where you put debt into a market, which includes financial assets as well, have gone up by much, much more than eggs and milk and stuff that we just buy with cash. But then why and with cars for the most part with new cars we use finance to buy new cars so finance so there's a lot of money gets created in the in the active finance to buy new cars but not as much as housing because you know in theory the supply of new cars is 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 much less trapped but you're introducing all that new money into a market that is restricted into how much it can expand because of stupid planning laws that only huge corporations have got the nows to be able to navigate. So it's two things that have driven up house prices, the inability of the housing market to expand and, um, and debt. Now I'll give you a good stat. Between 1997 and 2007, uh, the population grew by 5%, I think. And the housing stock grew by 10%. So in that case, you would expect house prices to be more or less flat or maybe even come down a bit. But house prices went up by 350%, three and a half times in that period. And it was the, it was the supply. But then you also look at mortgage lending over the same period. And that also went up by 350%. So it's a consequence of fiat money and debt and the Bank of England not measuring inflation properly. Uh, chap in the second back row, I think, by the cupboards there. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is you said um, there are things like Bitcoin that you think cryptocurrency is very um, like applicable to. I'm curious what those are because um, money is quite a special thing and it's like a global collective myth. Um, and therefore you need something that's sort of decentralized. So I'm curious, like what other things um, you think would be like perfect applications for like blockchain? Is it like law or um, just governance of societies generally? And my second question is, um, sorry, these are quite separate, but uh, my second question is, I think you mentioned that um, there's certain like ideas that are more acceptable to be spoken of loudly like even as a comedian like there's more there's some ideas that you're more likely to be able to speak of in public is that why, why do you think that is is that um is that just something to do with human nature or is it is it a function of what uh collectively like held beliefs in society that you cannot sort of go against so that's well uh, to answer your second question some ideas are more acceptable than others and often the worst thing you can be to an idea is early. You know, you can be early to an idea, but in three or four years time, this, it will be mainstream. 
and and so yeah like i think it's generally possible to say now for example that too much immigration is not a good thing i don't believe you could say that a few years ago i mean i think you were racist if you said that so that's an example of uh how the acceptability of an idea changes and that's why these words what douglas murray calls magic spell words are such powerful things where you can go you're a whatever you're a and then you have the magic spell thing uh, and you, you and and you, effectively you can get that person cancelled or as they used to call it excommunicated <laughs> it's the same thing um so that hopefully answers your, your second question and there's a great mnemonic and it's it's so great and i can't remember it money is a matter of functions for a medium a measure a unit and a store something like that so there's four functions of money and whenever people are criticizing bitcoin they'll go oh well I'm, you're not going to use it to go into starbucks and buy a cup of coffee well, that's just looking at it purely as medium of exchange. And what it is, it was originally designed to be was medium of exchange for the internet. And it is a brilliant means, it is a brilliant thing for a medium of exchange for high value transactions or low value transactions across the internet. But it's also proved a brilliant store. You know, it has been the best investment thing of whatever the last, since it's been invented. It hasn't reached unit of account status yet. Uh, it may well do. I mean, I actually think fiat money, government money, pounds, dollars, euros are terrible units of account because $10 today is not the same as $10 10 years ago. It's not the same as $10 50 years ago. So you, people have to come in with these complicated measures of inflation adjusted dollars and then nobody can agree what the definition of inflation is or how much inflation is and should you include house prices, inflation, whatever. So gold is a much better unit of account than, than fiat money because, you know, gold is constant and we've had gold since forever and it doesn't change and it, it grows at the same rate. The new gold supply grows at the same rate as population growth. So it's, it's, a, it's a much better... Bitcoin hasn't reached that yet. It may well do because of its finite supply. It might prove a really good unit of account. And then what was the th other one I said? Standard. Uh, and um, there are two possible interpretations of standard. Standard of deferred payment, but also standard as in gold standard. Uh, and, you know, already there are various corporations that have adopted a Bitcoin standard. Bitcoin is, they account in Bitcoin and they, uh, you know, MicroStrategy in, in the US and El Salvador has is, 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 uh, uh, is made Bitcoin legal tender. So these are all movements towards a Bitcoin standard. And there's even a book called The Bitcoin Standard, which has sold millions of copies. So it is, we are slowly moving towards that as well. But I don't think like, like Bitcoin's gonna, I see it, the future is quite high -echy and I just see everything coexisting you know we'll still have fiat money we'll still have bitcoin and we'll still have some other crazy coin and we'll have virgin air miles and you know we'll just have all different wallets and different monies for different things but not i don't see why not okay. um the, the i mean many of those are technologically superior to bitcoin and many of them are technologically inferior but what they don't have is the the mass adoption okay. The, 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 what do you call it, the network effect. They don't have that. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Um. So thank you, Dominic. I think that was really interesting. And I think that's the longest I've been at the IEA before someone mentioned Hayek. And <laughs> um, on that, you, you mentioned Thatcher, just mentioned Hayek, you mentioned a few other people, apart from obviously yourself. Who would you say is the best sort of libertarian philosopher, writer, thinker that one should look up to better understand the main issues? Um, I don't know. I, I, that's an interesting question. There's a woman, I presume it's a woman, uh, on her, well, she's on Twitter. And she calls herself Adam Smith's granddaughter or something like that. 
And uh, she just comes out with this stuff and I just, everything she says, I'm like, that's great. I wish I thought of that. So I like her. There's a few guys, you know, who are going around talking. There's a few good books. I'm, I'm actually really, I don't know if other people are like this, but I'm really struggling to read books in this day and age because every time I would go to read a book, I'd pick up my phone instead. And so the phone always wins. And so my reading is, is not good. Um, but there are, there's, some, there's a guy called George Mack who I've subscribed to his newsletter. I wouldn't really call him a libertarian. He's a young guy in his 30s, maybe. And he kind of does these hacks. But his, his newsletter is really brilliant and it's, it's genuinely original. And then there's a podcast called Modern Wisdom. And I've forgotten the name of the guy who, who hosts that. But his newsletter is pretty good as well. So I'm going to say George Mack, but I don't think he's particularly libertarian, but I, th I think he's a really interesting philosopher. He's the guy who springs to mind that I've been following in the last few weeks. All right. Anything else? Oh, Tom. I was very interested in what you said at the about the comedy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was very interested in the, when you said that comedy forces clarity. Yeah. Because I think you're right. I think financial markets love jargon. And when we're struggling to convey, I work in the financial markets to our clients, what we're talking about, we easily resort to jargon. But and, and, and often your clients probably want to know, is this market going up or down? Yes. And you're like, um, well, uh, you know, and, and, and that's where they are. I haven't got a clue, but I don't want to, I don't want to admit that. The, um, but the, uh, the, you're right, but I think that um, when you do try to be clear, you end up being incredibly verbose because you're trying to convey sometimes some very complex things and you want to introduce conditionality and all the things that may blow these things off course and you become incredibly boring. So what's the, the comedian's tip as to how to be clear without becoming verbose? Oh, my God. Um just maybe tell yourself just before you speak, I'm only allowed three sentences or something like that. I mean, I think it, it, it's, um, it's really hard. And I think there are some people who are just naturally blunt. And so they have that clarity. And, but, you know, one man who you admire for his bluntness, another person might see that guy as rude. And, and sometimes you don't want to be blunt because you, it's a courtesy thing. Um, but then often in being courteous, you're avoiding the truth. Uh, you know, well, not avoiding the truth, but just beating around the bush a little bit. So it's a, I guess, but I guess if you go, how do I say this in three sentences? Bosh might be a good way of doing it. Yeah. Or how can I make this funny? <laughs> might be another one. All right. Um, okay, yes, and then at the back. We'll take probably two final questions then. I think we're running out of time. Um, the securitization market and subprime mortgages uh, caused the last financial crisis. Uh, since then, the versions of Basel regulation have collateralized the financial system. So uh, we've seen the fall of uh, Credit Suisse, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, a couple of other American sort of state banks and everything else. But in the whole, the financial spheres remain pretty solid. So is this because the next disaster has not reared its head yet? Or do you think that the financial regulation has actually, in fact, remedied the too big to fail financial vulnerabilities? That's an interesting thought. The, the, I mean, I, I think the regulation that came to the UK has I mean, the UK banks are in reasonable shape, I guess, from a balance sheet point of view. But I think they've also killed the UK as a competitor. Mm. And, you know, Mother Nature can be a great regulator herself and, and she just issues bankruptcy. And, and if you just if, if a guy operates and he doesn't operate well and he goes bankrupt, that's kind of leads to a healthy market. But you have too big to fail and all that. So you could make the case that regulation has worked because things seem to be better than they were. But I am of the mind that the problem is fiat money. And so 
the solution is sound money, not lots of regulation. But that's that's a, a libertarian uh, point of view. Um, I would like to say, I do think. I'm just deviating just because I wanted to say this because I always like to say it. And um, in a in a like a um, zombie film or in a um, a film about a pandemic pandemic, often the trope of the film is that you have to get to the zero patient patient zero, where the where the virus started, and you either have to kill the zero patient, or the zero patient will give you the antidote, and then you can save the world from this global global pandemic. In if we're, you know, if libertarians are to win, I think there are two zero patients, or but they're they're crossover. The, the zero patient for me is money. We need sound money, and I, I know that's never been a particularly IEA thing, the sound money thing. But I, I, you know, I really well, it depends what you mean by it. But we're, that's okay. another conversation. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I just think we need sound money that governments can't print when it suits them, because as soon as one body in a society has the power to create money at no cost to itself. That gov that body has too much power and too much reach, and that's where we are under fiat money. But then, when you're coming out of it, the other zero patient, you design a society by the way you tax it. You give all the incentives, how much freedom people are going to have, how much scope they are to 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 invent and be bold. And so, you know, if I was had Rishi Sunak or whoever. Uh, Keir Starmer or whoever's here, I would go, just never mind all the other stuff, go straight to our HMRC and redesign the tax system and everything else will follow. And and you design a society the way you t you, you tax it. And, and I, that's, I've made my point. Brilliant. One final question from the back. Hey, I just have one question. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I just have one question, um, basically two questions. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> These are inflationary challenges. <laughs> um, as you were saying, about gold standard was better than fiat money because it made trade easier in the past. And also uh, it was like deflationary in, uh, in nature. So is Bitcoin, would you consider Bitcoin as um, digital gold standard? And if yes, then given what happened in the Great Depression and a lot of research suggesting that Gold standard was the culprit. What do you think um, the future of the Bitcoin? Well, what's quite interesting about I've got a chart that shows consumer prices from the night in the nineteenth century, and from eighteen six we went off the gold standard in in the Napoleonic Wars to print the money to pay for the Napoleonic Wars. We went back on the gold standard eighteen sixteen, the Great Recoinage, and between eighteen sixteen and the mid eighteen fifties. So in one generation consumer prices more than halved and so ordinary workers saw the value of their salary it bought them more and that was you know almost in itself it was incredibly it enabled the middle class to have money beyond having to pay for house clothing you know had beyond the immediate necessities and that enabled the middle class to grow and educate themselves and created a middle class that didn't previously exist and then um, prices went back up again in the American Civil War and then they came back down again and they fell all the way to 1914. So workers who saved saw the purchasing power of their money increase. And that's an incredibly powerful thing, which we just have not experienced in the last hundred years. We've seen the purchasing power of our money deteriorate and with it, the erosion of the middle class, I think. So I, I think that's, I think sound money is really important. Um, the problem with the gold standards, everyone went back on the gold standards, but they all went on at the wrong rates and they cheated it. And they went back in the 20s and then they came off in the 30s. It just didn't work. It was a mess because by that point, governments had printed and spent so much money. They basically issued more money than they had gold to back it. And so it, England going back on in, in the 20s, we missed out on the entire boom of the 20s because we had a, we, it sort of sent us into a deflation. And eventually we abandoned it in whatever it was, 31 or 32, but everywhere abandoned gold all through the 30s. So I'd like to see a government, I don't believe governments will go, except for in exceptional cases like El Salvador, I don't think governments will voluntarily go on Bitcoin standards because Bitcoin is so amazingly rewarded early adopters. I think people 
don't like the idea of buying it now because they feel they're enriching those early adopters. And, and I've, I think governments are more likely, if there's some kind of currency crisis, they've all got gold. They're more likely to def, default to go the gold to take the gold route than the Bitcoin route. I would have thought, but often what people do and what governments do, they're not the same. And I, I you know, bit, more and more people are. I, I can't remember the exact number, but we're. At, I think we're at. We're. I think we're north of. I think we're two hundred million Bitcoin users worldwide now. That's a lot of people, and it's growing all the time. And the best advert for Bitcoin is Bitcoin price going up. <laughs> so you know, the, the longer it continues to go up, the more people will start using it. Dominic, thank you very much. It's probably one of the most wide ranging conversations that we've had at one of these IA events. Feels like we've covered it a little. Um, I think next time, perhaps we'll ask you to bring the ukulele and you can sure. serenade us during drinks. Um, you have uh, to change your name to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. Um, yeah, drinks will continue across the hall. Thank you all for coming and please join me again in thanking Dominic for his time this evening. <laughs>